I wanted to start transitioning ourselves toward a discussion of how compilers work. And this is going to be acting as a kind of a vehicle towards the rest of the topics for the semester. But basically, a compiler is just a program that reads in a file as input and then transforms that file into some other kind of output and then writes that file to disk. That's basically all a compiler does. Uh, anytime you write a program that does essentially that, it pulls in a file, does something to that file, then outputs a new file, we're kind of like training you to get this idea of what a compiler does. I mean, right now, your assignments maybe read in a file that consists of some text and then maybe do something like capitalize all the letters or um, you know take out the punctuation or something like that. But you're doing a transformation to the text and then outputting the results to another file. That's basically what a compiler does. It's just it's a little more complicated. So a modern compiler actually takes your source code and transforms it in several different ways, with the final result being that target language that you're going for, which may be the actual ones and zeros, the binary code for the processor that you're running it on, or it could be some other language. Compilers don't have to compile down to machine code. They can compile to other languages. For example, Java to JavaScript compilers that allow you to write a Java program, transform it into JavaScript, and then run it on a web browser. And you probably already know that Java itself is compiled not to the native ones and zeros, the machine code for the processor. In fact, it's just compiled for a virtual machine. It's compiled to the ones and zeros for that virtual machine, and then another program takes over to transform those ones and zeros into the native ones and zeros. Most programming languages aren't really just starting with your source code and going all the way down to the native ones and zeros. They go through a series of steps, and whether all those steps take place up front during the explicit compilation phase, or whether they take place some up front and some later on, you know, it doesn't matter. But eventually, your source code gets transformed into some other programming language. So let's draw this diagram here. So you start with your source code, which could be C or Java or Python. And then the source code goes through the first step, which is known by a variety of names. It's either called a scanner or a lexer or a tokenizer. And let's say that the source code that you're compiling is really simple. All it does is allows you to do uh, variable assignment and execution of expressions. So let's say it's something like x equals 3 times y plus 6. So, you know, let's say that's the source code that you put in. So the job of the scanner or lexer or tokenizer is to go through that source code and identify all of the parts and give each one of those parts a name. Kind of like going through a sentence in English or French or whatever and identifying all of the parts of speech. Like this is a noun, this is a verb, this is an article, this is an adverb. And what comes out the other end is called a token stream. So it's taken the source code, x equals 3 times y plus 6, and then it's, a, it's, it's basically tagged each one of these pieces with you know, what that thing is. This x over here, which we might call a variable in compiler speak, is called an identifier. It's a name for something. And then this, this 3 right here, that's a, that's a number. In particular, it's an integer. And depending upon your programming language, there may be a distinction between integers and floating point numbers. Or it could be there's no distinction. It's just a number. Then this y here, that's an identifier also. The 6 is an integer. And then those other symbols, like this equal sign here, that's the assignment operator. Uh, operators are basically symbols or operations that sit in the middle and then uh, usually have operands, like 3 plus 4, the operator is the plus, and the 3 and the 4 are the operands. And then the asterisk is the multiplication operator, the plus is the addition operator, and then even the semicolon on the end usually has a name. Um, just call it semicolon <laughs> because it doesn't really have any other name. But that's that's the token stream there. It's split it up basically into a, a series of tokens. Each one of those tokens has a name and it's got a value. So the name might be like an uh, integer and the value is three. Or the name might be multiplication operator. Or the name might be uh, identifier and the value is, is x or y. 
Okay, so that token stream comes out, and then it goes into the next phase. And this is called the parser. The parser's job is to take the token stream and then rearrange it into a, a data structure called an abstract syntax tree. So the abstract syntax tree takes the program code and hierarchically organizes it. Let me, let me draw what the abstract syntax tree might look like for this particular statement. Um, the other thing the abstract syntax tree also encompasses is the order of operations. So towards the bottom of the tree are the first operations you do, and towards the top of the tree are the last operations you do. So if you look at this statement here, the first operation we would do is we would multiply 3 and y together. And by the way, when you do an assignment, you always execute or evaluate the right-hand side, and then you do the left-hand side, which means the equals is basically the last thing you do, the actual assignment. So we've got the, the 3 and the y, and both of those have been tagged as integers and identifiers. And then we combine those together and do multiplication. This is the multiplication operator. Then we've got the 6, which is combined together to met with the plus operator. This is an integer. And then the add operator. And then finally, these are joined together with the x. This is an identifier. And this is the assignment. So the parser really does two things. First of all, it organizes the program into an abstract syntax tree. And if it is successful in doing so, it means that the program you have fed into this compiler obeys the rules of the language. It's kind of like the grammar of the language. So the rules of the language might mean um, if you are going to multiply things together, there must be something to the left and to the right of the multiply sign. Or if you're going to do an assignment, there must be a variable, an identifier, sitting off to the left-hand side, and an expression off to the right-hand side. So the final thing is to notice that in this abstract syntax tree, we've also embodied the order of operations. We've got 3 and, and, and y multiplied together, and then that comes up and adds that to the, the result of that to the 6, and then the result of that addition gets assigned to x. And so you can build an abstract syntax tree out of an entire program that includes loops and conditionals and assignments and, and uh, functions. You build one giant syntax tree out of that entire program. And if you're successful, if the parser is successful in doing so, it means that the program is grammatically correct. Okay, what the parser doesn't do at this point is evaluate whether the program makes sense. You know, that's, uh, that's for another phase, which I'm going to show you next. The abstract syntax tree then goes into the next phase, semantic analysis. Semantic is a fancy word that means what something means. So the semantic analysis goes through and it makes sure that the program makes sense. It applies additional rules to your program. And these rules are ones about like the order that things happen in. For example, your programming language may require you to declare a variable before you use it. And so semantic analysis will make sure that that happens. Um, another thing about semantic analysis would be um, make sure that when I do an assignment, I'm matching up the types correctly. Like if I have x, which is declared to be an integer, and I have a string, hello, I can't assign the string to x because my particular language disallows that sort of assignment. So the semantic analysis asks the question and verifies, does the program make sense? So the abstract syntax tree comes out of semantic analysis and it goes into code generation. And this is where the final transformation is made from the basically the source code into the target language. The code generator might produce assembly language as its output. It might produce uh, another programming language like JavaScript as its output. Code generation goes through the abstract syntax tree, basically walks through the tree, looking at each one of the nodes in the tree. And for every single one of those nodes, it outputs some piece of code in your target language. And then most compilers will go through one additional phase called the optimizer. 
the optimizer's job is to take that target language and clean it up. Now, for example, if you just output assembly language for every single statement in the program, you'll probably find that there are some redundant, unnecessary things that get outputted. For example, you take the results of a calculation and put it into memory because it's, it goes into a variable, and then you take the contents of that variable and pull it back out into a register. So you didn't really need to put it in a memory just to pull it back out again. You could eliminate those two statements and clean up the code a bit. Or you can do what's called dead code elimination. If you've got an if-else condition and the compiler determines that the if is always going to be true, then you can eliminate the else section entirely. Or there's a function that doesn't get called anywhere. It gets declared, it gets defined, so you can just eliminate that. So these are all things that the code optimizer does to kind of clean up the, the resulting uh, target language, make it more compact, and uh, make it run faster. So I hope at some point in a college or university degree program, you do end up taking a course in compiler construction, because I think it's, it's really kind of a big eye-opener. It takes all the stuff that you've been learning, data structures, um, you know, how to read and write files, and how to um, you know, transform data from one form into another, and it puts that all together to produce this program that just reads in a file which consists of source code and outputs another file which consists of more source code in another language. For me personally, it was a, uh, it was a two, uh, two quarter, but two semester sequence. The first semester, we just focused entirely on writing the lexer. That was it. That's all we did is, is getting it through that first box. And then the second semester, we did the rest of it up through code generation. So by the end of the, the year, we had this compiler that could take a, a small programming language. You know, it wasn't a, a huge language like Java or C or anything like that. It was a very compact, small, simple language for just doing educational purposes. Um, and took it up through code generation. Now the code it produced was horrible and slow and bloated, but it worked. And then when I went on to my graduate studies, my master's program, that's when we did that final box, the code op uh, the optimizer box. And so we learned how to take the code generated by that compiler that we wrote in our undergraduate and then clean up the code and learn about ways to optimize the code, like reduce the number of registers being used and um, dead code elimination and um, you know, evaluating constants at compile time, things like that. And I really think that that was kind of one of those aha moments in my, in my education when I went from, oh, there's this magical thing called a compiler that we type programs into and it, tra and it makes them run, to, wow, I really kind of understand how this stuff all works. And compilers aren't, that mis aren't really mysterious anymore. They're just computer programs that people wrote. Sometimes they have bugs in them. We hope that they don't have too many bugs in them but sometimes they have bugs in them, and um, it's, it's people like you and I who make compilers better and better, especially that last box, that optimizer box, is where a lot of the research in compilers goes on today in uh, getting the code to run faster and faster.